Will everybody please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United, United States, United States, States of, America. of America, to the Republic, and for which it stands, for which it stands. One nation, one nation, one nation under God, under God, God indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, liberty for, all. And justice for, all. for all. I think I officially forgot to say the meeting is started, so it's okay. So. <laughs> New Jersey Open Public's meeting law was enacted to ensure the right of the public to have advance notice of and to attend the meeting of public bodies at which any business affecting their interests is discussed or acted upon. In accordance with the provisions of this act, the Cedar Grove Board of Education has caused notice of this meeting to be advertised by having the meet, time, and place thereof posted on bulletin boards in the district, published and transmitted to the Verona Cedar Grove Times and Star Ledger newspapers, tapped into online news, filed with the township clerk and posted on the district's website. Roll call, please. Mrs. DeChara. Here. Mrs. Miga. Here. Mrs. Pandorio. Present. Mr. Schoner. Present. Mrs. Dye. Here. The meeting is open to the public for comment on items on the agenda. Seeing none. Well, welcome everybody to uh, another virtual board of that meeting. How's everybody doing this evening? Good. Hello. Hello. Fantastic. Again, I ask if you are not a board member, if you could please mute yourself until the public session, that would be really helpful. So we're going to move it along. Uh, tonight we have two um, board presentations. Uh, we're going to get started with the first one from our business administrator, Mr. DeVita. Um, and he is going to speak about uh, the update on the security referendum. Good evening, Mr. Gavita. Hey, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm going to break up this um, into two parts. Uh, we have worked at um, uh, construction work, and then we have the security part of it. Um, so first, I'll start with the uh, construction part of it. Um, uh, work that was completed in all the schools um, is, is uh, the window film was uh, put on all of the first floor windows. Uh, the high school um, received a new security vestibule in the front. Uh, they also received the new uh, ADA handicap ramp uh, inside the, the front entrance. Uh, they, they received the new generator and some new electrical upgrades. Uh, the middle school uh, received some new doors in the security vestibule, and the pole station was moved from uh, inside the security vestibule to outside of it. Uh, South End School has received new walkways uh, on top of the stairs by the um, by the basketball courts and the, uh, the drainage, was, which also fixed up there. Uh, the uh, uh, pole station was also moved out of the security vestibule and um, the door hardware uh, inside the security vestibule has been updated. In, in North End School, um, the ADA uh, handicap ramps were all placed outside of um, a lot of the classrooms. Uh, so now the school is uh, ADA compliant. Uh, the pole station was moved um, like in the other schools out of the security vestibule. And the uh, door hardware uh, was updated in the security vestibule. Um, as far as not completed work uh, w w related to the construction, um, there's still some concrete repair work that has to be done at North End School. Uh, they're currently working on that uh, now. Um, uh, the door hardware um, for the middle school and high school uh, inside the security vestibules, they have to be complete. Um, uh, new railings uh, for the high school uh, ADA compliant ramp, uh, they have to be installed. Um, and some flooring, uh, painting, uh, some new cabinets um, inside the high school, uh, new pavers uh, outside of the uh, security vestibule in the high school have to be complete. And um, the, the, the windowsill and, and some uh, uh, stucco has to be completed at the high school. Um, and from, from what I'm told, uh, all of this work should be completed over the summer and be ready for the start of school. Uh, next, I'll go to the security uh, portion of the project. Um, uh, pretty much uh, all of the, the, the work that we started, um, all of the, the back end stuff ha has been complete. Um, uh, the, the work that we um, uh, ha have done, uh, we have all new cabling uh, for video, ac video access control, uh, strobe lighting, uh, panic buttons has been installed in all of the schools. Uh, fiber for the networking has been installed in the high school and middle school. Uh, uh, backboards and data racks has been installed in the high school, uh, middle school, north end and south end. Uh, network switches for video and access control has been installed in all the schools. Uh, a new video recorder servers has, has been installed. Uh, new video workstations and video monitors have been installed in all of the schools. Uh, existing interior and exterior cameras 
uh, have been rolled over into the, the new video system. Uh, that means that all of our, our existing cameras um, uh, it's been rolled into our, our new system. So now we just have one um, uh, camera system. Uh, we have new panic buttons and strobe lights has been installed in all the schools. A uh, new access control server has been installed in all the in the, in the high school, and a uh, new door locks uh, has been installed in the middle school, north end, and south end schools. And the existing door locks uh, that were in the high school has been rolled over into our new um, access control system. Uh, so, so um, a lot of the uh, the backing work has all been complete. Uh, now we're just um, we have some work that has to be um, a cut over, um, meaning that it has to be rolled into the the, the new system. The uh, basically. Uh, tested to, to see if it, it works um so we still have to um uh, do that for uh, um a lot of the some of the main entrance doors uh some of the the uh, boiler room doors uh we're, we're um uh, our new um uh, class uh, security system uh that that uh, server is, is ready installed but it just has to be tested um and then uh, we have to get uh, training on all of the uh, systems uh, for all of our um uh, the staff inside um that are working and then also um, our, our teachers uh, w once they come back um, they will be trained on the the system also uh, so all of this work that, that remains uh, should be completed um, over the next um, a month uh, so we should have it all complete um, just like the construction work for the start of uh, school in September. That's fantastic great so we have been moving along all yes. this time. Yes we have. Awesome glad to hear it. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. And then our next presentation is going to be um, by our guest speaker, Mr. Anthony Grasso, who, yes, is our incoming super, but he's not the super yet. So he is a guest and he will be speaking to us about the results of the survey that was sent out to both the parents and the staff of the school district. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'd like to take you uh, through the results. I know that um, the results were sent out to the families and caregivers of Cedar Grove um, recently. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to just kind of walk you through this and tell you where we are uh, in the process. So the survey method was, um, it was, it was proposed to the families and caregivers on the 6th of July and closed on the 12th. It was through an online survey. And the purpose of the survey was to gather as much feedback as we possibly could from families and caregivers um, from elementary to high school. And this was to, to really take in what the um, experience was from March until June with remote learning and to try to get a, uh, a gauge on where families were at that current moment in time about going back to school. And I do understand there is a much anticipated um, wait for the plan to come out, but this is crafting that plan. Uh, the survey participation from all the families and caregivers in Cedar Grove uh, yielded around 612 participants. And the majority of the participants uh, range from elementary school and then gradually worked its way down from middle to high school. Uh, when we look at the health and safety aspects of, of that survey, when um, we looked at how many people were feeling uh, comfortable, comfortable wanting to send their children back to school, uh, overall, there was an overwhelming 60% of people who want to send their children back to school. Elementary and high school were pretty equal at the almost uh, three quarters of the, of the percentage of participants where middle school was ranging at half percent, uh, sorry, a half of the participation level. Um, if we look at, you know, the, the families feeling confident sending their children back and maintaining safe opera school operations and social distancing uh, to mitigate the risks, um, like we anticipated, around 50% of all participants were kind of, they didn't really know. They didn't know. I think people will really start to, de to develop that based on their, um, once the plan comes out, and that will start to develop a judgment for them. But overall, around 36% felt at that time that they were, they felt very comfortable. Uh, elementary, middle, and high school all ranged in that in that very confident level at around the 30 to 40% range, while that middle um moderately confident was when was winning out most of the time uh if we look at our if school opens in the fall and if people felt that um knowing that their child is required to wear a mask uh elementary came in at the lowest percentage while high school and middle school came at in, at the most and that's understandable especially for our 
our primary students where masking um, wouldn't obviously be um, an issue. But overall, it was a it was a split of 33, 44, and 23 percent where they were not feeling confident at all. If we look at if school buildings were to reopen again in the fall, and there was um, the, if, if the students were utilizing their traveling methods with a mandated mask, around 50%, 54, over 50% of the population felt that uh, they were very, very confident in that, uh, in the current practices, if masking was um, provided. What was very interesting was um, when we looked at what would make people feel safe for their child to return to school um, on a daily basis? And around 86% of the participants felt very, very comfortable with, with uh, students and staff if they, were, if they were required to have temperature checks. And 75% uh, of the participants felt very comfortable um, with uh, staff wearing masks. And then uh, I think the, the least... Um, comfortable that's, that the participants felt was if face shields were worn by staff as a protectant. Uh, when we looked at reducing po the possible spread of the coronavirus, um, this is a very interesting model because there were there was the model from the from the district, and then there then there were individual school based committee models. So on this particular model that we sent out to the district, the alternating days. Uh, seemed to outweigh any of the other options where the alternating weeks came, they were coming in um, very close with that. Obviously, the AM and PM sessions uh, did not uh, bode well in the survey, but the direct opposite took place when there were the individual school based um, committees where the alternating weeks uh, were were looked upon as if they were the most uh, beneficial for students and most consistent for curriculum and delivery of instruction, as well as the ability to deliver um, special services to our students with disabilities. So then when we look at our remote learning, how did remote learning go? And it's really, it, it, we need to be very careful when we look at the remote learning because remote learning in March through June was an emergent uh, issue. And when we look at moving forward is a planned issue. So fit, around 50, half of the participants, over half of the participants, around 54.4%, felt that uh, remote learning did not, did not necessarily have a positive effect on their children's learning, though 43% of all the participants, they did feel that the remote learning uh, that was offered was engaging, rigorous, and that it was aligned with the curriculum. Uh, when we look at early childhood, we're talking about our pre K and our kindergarten primary um, levels. 52% of all of the elementary families felt that uh, remote, the current remote learning options did not allow uh, for effective play-based learning. And that's understandable because uh, students did not have the ability to interact with each other as they would in a face-to-face -face basis. When we looked at keeping families in mind uh, during this process, 50% of the participants felt that, it, that uh, Cedar Grove Public Schools did take into consideration the domestic needs of families during this time. And around 38% of the population um, who participated in this survey felt that they that remote learning effectively recognized student achievement and emotional well-being of students. Uh, when we look at learning tools that were utilized during this time, 80% of the participants felt very comfortable being able to provide these tools to the children, and 64% of the of the participants felt that they were prepared uh, for with the necessary to tools to protect their children from um, any type of online harassment. So overall. What did this tell us? It told us that basically that a schedule, that people want to send their children back to school, but they want to send their children back to school with the appropriate schedule and with the appropriate health and safety precautions put in place. Uh, they look at, people are looking and, and, and our families are looking for as many days back as possible during a week. Um, they're looking, they're feeling that masking of staff and students is a comfortable first step but they feel strongly that temperature checks and daily and staggered schedules um, would be the best possible steps forward. Uh, our families are looking for a planned use of remote learning compared to an emergent use of remote learning. And we have to remember, we have to really remember that as we move forward through the months of September, October, November, that we must be prepared uh, that 
those options of going back into your uh, full remote or virtual learning or could possibly happen. So that's why we want to utilize the time now to plan for that and to practice that and participate in that. Uh, one of the biggest pieces that came out of the survey was the ability to have live meets. Uh, one of the, the biggest feedback from our remote learning survey, uh, families want to have more uh, live meets and frequent live meets um, during the week. And it provided that face-to-face -face ability to interact with students and with uh, their teachers. And the biggest piece of this and the biggest takeaway was communication is key. Uh, and, and families really wanted that, that either daily in some instances or weekly communication. Um, so we knew, so they knew what to expect and how to proceed forward. So that was what our, um, our district survey, um, the return back to school provided, um, us in moving forward and preparing a plan. Great. Thank you. And I want to let everybody know that the results of these surveys were emailed to all of the parents, but the presentation itself, we can put that on our board website um, so you can access that. But I, except for, I think, the overview, pretty much everything had been sent home to the parents already. But just look for that tomorrow morning and we'll have that posted. So thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, did you want to make any high level yes. comments about the return? I know people are very anxious to, to hear about that. Um, full disclosure that we will not be revealing a full plan this evening. Um, we will be revealing our full plan the first week in August. And I know everybody's a little worried about dates and 30 days and this and that. And uh, on the agenda, you can actually see that we are moving the start date of school. Right now, it's set to start before Labor Day. We're actually going to have it start after Labor Day to give us a little more time to plan. So. So when we when we introduce the plan, um, it will it will be very detailed and it, it will be able to answer a lot of the questions. And I myself, as a parent, um, am anxious to see what my own district will be doing. But just to give you a an overview of what to expect and, and to to try to um, ease in the the. Um, the anticipation of this, um, when you do receive uh, the presentation and when you do receive the plan itself, there's several areas that we will be um, addressing. So the first area will be our, our student health and safety guidance for schools. There will be a document for staff as well. Um, but this will go over entrance protocols with contactless in-person visitor protocols, uh, contactless uh, in-person staff protocols, as well as contactless in-person student protocols. Um, there will be information about screening stations, as well as information about facilities cleaning procedures. Uh, it, will it will go into depth about hand sanitation, about air circulation in classrooms, about, the seat about seating in classrooms about alternative classroom and seating arrangements for students. It will go on to uh, explaining about the sharing of objects or the non-sharing of objects, uh, school supplies, what to anticipate and what to expect and, and how uh, that will be handled this year. What will building traffic flow look like? And what will hallway and stairwell traffic flow look like in each of the buildings? Uh, there will be a section where we will go into bathrooms and how that will work throughout the course of the days as well as the cleaning procedures in bathrooms. Uh, we will go into about the social and emotional learning for students during the during these times, as well as what will take, how will the nurse's office operate as a nurse's office uh, on a regular basis and as triage areas. It will break down the illness itself for COVID-19 and what will daily health screenings and guidance for parents look like. Uh, what happens in the building if there's a suspected case of COVID for a student or for a staff member? What happens in the building if there is a confirmed case of COVID? And what happens, what happens if there is a student that enters the building when they were exposed to a household member who has COVID or they were exposed to COVID. Uh, there will be a section that will go into contact tracing for our students um, and our staff members. It will also go into depth about extracurricular activities as well as field trips based on these new protocols. Um, 
It will go into our enrollment options. And as everybody has been aware that this week, the governor, Governor Murphy, has shared that there will be an all virtual option. Uh, We will go into depth. And this is what parents and caregivers are looking and staff are looking for the most. Uh, What will that schedule look like? How many days a week will we have face to face learning? And what happens if I if I decide to give my child virtual learning? What will that look like? And what will the delivery of instruction look like? Um, there will be a section that breaks down what in-person instruction looks like with, with social distancing. Uh, what happens to students' bo- student belongings? Where do they go? How do they deal with that? How do students deal with that? Uh, what happens during recess and physical education? Uh, there will be an overview of technology as a whole. What will happen during meals and lunch? How will transportation be provided for for students and what will the protocols be on the bus? And also, what will the protocols be for car car riders when they enter upon the school building? Uh, There will also be what we call the EDLTP, which is the Emergency Distance Learning Transition Plan. And that plan will be if we get a call from the governor that states that we must go on all virtual We enact that plan. Uh, We will go into um, depth about what full-time online instruction looks like. And then there will be a section about frequently asked questions, which will continue to build as well as um, the distance learning plan supports for students with disabilities. And in this plan, which uh, everybody will get um, an opportunity to look at and have, there will be parent resources and parent tips and strategies on how to move forward. So it will be a pretty lofty plan, but it's very important that everybody has as much information as we possibly can offer them, as well as be as transparent as we possibly can. And we need to be very clear that this uh, that this document will be fluid based on what happens uh, within the state or within our county or with what happens within our district. So it certainly isn't normal, that's for sure. So I'm going to say that if anybody thinks that we're just going back to school and we're thinking that it's normal, we are certainly not. I mean, there's a plan for absolutely everything. Um, And that's why it's taking a little bit of time to finalize the plan. I know everybody's anxious and everybody wants to know what's going on. And I, as a parent, also want to know what's going on. But as, you know, as, as Tony just read off, there are so many things to consider and we want to make sure we get it right. So please just stand by and be a little patient and we will be releasing this um, at the very beginning of August and, uh, and you'll have a couple extra days of summer. So that's where we are on that one. Um, all right, then we are going to move on um, on the agenda. Uh, let's see. From the Office of the Business Administrator and Board Secretary under minutes, can I have a motion for B1 through B3? So moved. Second. B1 is a motion to approve the public and executive minutes of June 17th, uh, June 23rd, July 9th, and July 16th. B2 is a motion to approve the budgetary transfers for the month of June. And B3 is a motion to approve the board secretary certification to the city road station pursuant to the code that no line item account has encumbrances and expenditures which in total exceed the line item appropriation in violation of the code. Any discussion? No. Mrs. Dichara. Yes. Mrs. Miga. Yes. Mrs. Bondoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Aye. Yes. Under bills, can I have a motion for B4? So moved. Second. B4 is a motion to pay the following list of bills that were in our packet. <laughs> dated June 17th and July 1st. Any discussion? Roll no. Call. Mrs. DiCiara. Yes. Mrs. Miga. Yes. Mrs. Pandoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Aye. Yes. Under business, can I have a motion for B5 through B15? So moved. Second. Five is a motion to approve the quote from CDW E for the purchase of Chromebook through the CARES Emergency Relief Grant in the amount listed. B6 be resolved that in accordance with the CGEA agreement, the following employee should be paid for unused vacation days. B7 resolved that in accordance with the contractual agreement, the following employee shall be paid for unused vacation days. B8 is a motion to approve Zenith Construction Services Inc. payment application number three in the amount listed. 
B9 is a motion to accept the generous donation from the Cedar Grove High School Yearbook Club in the amount listed to be used to purchase new MacBooks for the yearbook class and club production. B10 is a motion to approve the memorandum of agreement between the Cedar Grove Board of Ed and CS and JS. B11 is a motion to approve the amendment to the school transportation contract for the 1920 school year. B12 is a motion to approve the amendment to the school transportation contract for the 1920 school year. B13 is a motion to approve the below listed transportation routes for renewal of transportation contracts with NW Transport for the 2021 school year. B14 is a motion to approve the below listed transportation routes for renewal of transportation contracts with NW Transport LLC for the 2021 school year. I'm sorry, that's not NW's, uh, it is for LD. Elden, sorry, Elden Transportation, that's B14, is not NW Transport, that's B13. B14 is Elden Transportation, sorry about that. And B15 is a motion to approve the quote from Worth Avenue Group to, to provide insurance coverage um, as listed. Any discussion? No. Mrs. <clears throat> Dechara. Yes. Mrs. Miga. Yes. Mrs. Pondoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. Under personnel, can I have a motion for S1 through S16? So moved. Second. S1 is a motion to retroactively approve Michael J. Featherman's revision of resignation date to July 17th. S2 is a motion to revise the start date for Anthony Grasso, superintendent of schools, to August 3rd. S3 is a motion to retroactively approve Michael DeVita as acting superintendent from July 18th to August 2nd. S4 is a motion to approve Jennifer Walter, North End Maternity Leave Replacement. S5 is a motion to approve Monica Fox, North End School Part-Time Secretary. S6 is a motion to approve Lila Wilder, North End Part-Time Secretary. S7 is a motion to approve Megan McLeod, uh, paraprofessional at North End. S8 is a motion to approve Nicolette McCarthy, high school special ed teacher. S9 is a motion to approve the following Lincoln liaison um, for the 2021 year. S10 is a motion to approve summer work for the following guidance counselors at their per diem rate of pay. S11 is a motion to approve the extra class stipend for the 2021 school year at the rate listed. S22 is a motion to authorize attendance at the following events. S13 as a motion to approve the following students for classroom observation. S14 as a motion to approve the following leaves of absence. S15 as a motion to approve a revision to the 2021 school district school calendar to reflect a change of start date for all instructional staff to September 3rd and for students to September 8th, 2020. S16 as a motion to accept the resignation of Joseph Cardinal, high school business teacher as of September 14th. Any discussion? No. 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 Uh, a couple things I want to discuss. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, Mr. Devita, for stepping in and playing yet another role in uh, in this in this business of ours. We appreciate your service for the next. Uh, secondly, um, so we we changed Mr. Featherman's um, date so he could start sooner in his new district, um, as we understand, because we want our super to start sooner in our district. And, uh, and we thank Mr. Featherman for 11 years, you know, seven, obviously, on the board uh, as superintendent. Um, and we wish, him, uh, we wish him a lot of luck in his, uh, in his new gig. Um, and we are very excited that our new superintendent, uh, Tony Grasso, will be starting on August 3rd. Uh, and we, we can't wait. Um, we're very excited. And we look forward to working with him. So that's that. Uh, and oh, and uh, we welcome. It's always exciting when we hire a high school alum as uh, to be a teacher. So welcome to Miss McCarthy. We're excited. Not only is she the co cheerleading coach, she's now going to also be a teacher. So we're excited about that. And we miss. We wish Mr. Cardinal the best uh, as he goes on his next adventure. Uh, any further discussion? Agreed on all. Yes. Thanks. <laughs> Mrs. Nichara. Yeah. Mrs. Miga. Yeah. Mrs. Pondoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. Um 
Let's see. Under, I lost my train of thought. I'm sorry. Under policies, uh, I think before I approve anything, you have a lot of reading to do. Is that right, Mr. Julia? All righty. My first act as acting superintendent. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll read through. Uh, I'm going to summarize the policies. We do have a lot of policies. Um, we, we usually get alerts um, every maybe like every few uh, months or so. Um, so this time we have uh, two alerts. Uh, we did get alert um, back in March, uh, but because of everything that was happening, we didn't get a chance to do those policies. Uh, so uh, here we, we have uh, two alerts. Um, uh, so, so there are a bunch of policies. So I'm just going to summarize them um, as quick as I can. Uh, I'll start with alert number 219 now for policy 152 for board officers. Uh, this revision is only applicable to boards that have selected the option of doing voting through a paper ballot. Um, Cedar Grove Board of Ed does verbal voting, so no changes are needed here. Policy 1581 um, and, and uh, the regulation 1581 are both for domestic violence. Uh, the New Jersey Civil Service Commission was required to develop uh, a uniform domestic violence policy for public employers, through that, uh, which encourages public employees who are victims to seek assistance from their human resources officers. The revised policy now incorporates all of the provisions of the Uniform Domestic Violence Policy as required by law, and the regulation is new, and both are mandated. Policy 2422 uh, is for health and physical education. Uh, this includes uh, three new statutes that were recently approved by the state. Uh, the first one is um, about financial literacy instruction. Second is the history of disabled and LGBTQ uh, persons included in the middle and high school curriculum. Uh, and the third is policies, procedures pertaining to inclusive instructional material. And this policy has been revised to list these requirements of the three new statutes, statutes and is mandated. Uh, next policy, uh, 3421.13 and also uh, 4421.13. They're, they're both uh, new policies for uh, postnatal accommodations. Um, the, the, the first one with the three in front of it is for st teaching staff members, and the second one with the four in front of it is for support staff members. And this just says that we have to provide lactation space when needed by a nursing mother. Uh, policy and regulation number 5330 is for the administration of medication. Uh, this policy and regulation has been revised to align with the new statutes for the administration of hydrocortisone, sodium, uh, succinate uh, for adrenal insufficiency and designates the school nurse and others to administer the medication. And this is a mandated policy. Next, we have policy 7243. This is for the supervision of construction. Uh, this, this revised policy addresses criminal history record checks for construction contractors and designates a liaison who shall be responsible to obtain a list of individuals who will be employed by the construction contractor that are required to undergo a criminal history record check, and this is a mandated policy. Policy 8210 is for the school year. Uh, this policy includes revisions um, uh, where we have to list the minimum number of the minimum duration of a school year to be no fewer than 180 school days. It also cites the statute that requires 180 school days to receive state aid and recommends a date of May 1st to have a school calendar approved by the board and it expands the circumstances or situations in which the school calendar can be altered by the board during the year. Policy 8220, as regarding the school day, this revised policy indicates that the board will approve a school calendar to improve the days and times schools are in session, including shortened days, and this is a mandated policy. Regulation 8220 is for school closings. Uh, this revised regulation has been updated to reflect more current practices of communicating an all-day school closing and an early dismissal with parents, staff, and other people and organizations. Policy 8462, this is for reporting potentially missing or abused children. This revised policy requires a board to display specific information in each school building about the Department or of Children and Families State Central Registry, which is a toll-free hotline for reporting child abuse. And this is a mandated policy. Next, we have policy alert 220. Uh, this first policy, uh, 1649, is for the Federal Families First Coronavirus Response Act, and it is a new policy. Uh, this act was recently approved by the U.S. Congress and signed by the President. It has two sections that impacts public schools and is a mandated policy. Uh, the first is the Emergency Family and Medical Leave Act, Leave Expansion Act. Uh, this amends the law to permit an employee who is unable to work or telework due to a need to care for their son or daughter under 18 years old if their school or place of care has been closed 
or the child care provider of the son or daughter is unavailable due to a public health emergency to be able to use federal, fam- federal medical and family leave. It provides for the leave to be paid by the employer in an amount not less than two-thirds of the employee's rate of pay. The second part is the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. Uh, This requires the employer to provide paid sick time to the extent the employee is unable to work or telework due to the employee being subject to a government-ordered quarantine. Uh, Advised by healthcare providers to self-quarantine or experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 and is seeking a medical diagnosis. Uh, Also caring for an individual who has been ordered to quarantine or has been advised to quarantine or caring for their son or daughter if the school or child care provider has been closed. And it provides for up to 80 hours of paid time off. Next is policy 2270. This is for religion and schools. This policy has been updated to align with the guidance from the United States Department of Education on constitutionally protected prayer and religious expression in public elementary and secondary schools. The guidance talks about religious literature, teaching about religion, student dress code, religious excusals, and the provisions of the Equal Access Act. The next policy, 2431.3, is a heat participation policy for student athlete safety. This revised policy mandates compliance with the NJSIAA's heat participation policy. The policy shall be carried out by the athletic trainer, a certified designee, or individual appointed by the administrator designated by the superintendent to supervise athletics which may be a coach or individual responsible for making decisions concerning the implementation of modifications or cancellations of practices and games. The new statute requires the use of a wet bulb globe temperature tool that measures heat stress on humans exposed to high temperatures. And this policy is mandated. Policy 2622 is for student assessment. This revision impacts the school district's requirement to administer an elementary school level statewide assessment for science through grade five when previously it was only required through grade four. Also, PARC has been removed from the policy and this policy is mandated. Policy and regulation 5111. Uh, This is the eligibility of resident and non-resident students. This revision indicates that a school district may not condition student enrollment on the fact the New Jersey Motor Vehicle Commission does not have the name or address of the parent on file. It also talks about permitting admittance of a J-1 visa student and this policy is mandated. Policy and Regulation 5200 for attendance. This revision addresses the statutory and administrative code requirements of student attendance. The first set of rules address how student attendance must be recorded in the school register that is used for state and federal reporting purposes. The second set of rules defines how a local school district permits excused and unexcused absences for purposes of truancy, student conduct, promotion, retention, and award of course credit. The regulation has been arised to provide a more detailed explanation of this of the distinction between attendance recording in the school register and attendance recordings. It also indicates that a parent shall be required to notify the school when a student will not be at school, and this policy is mandated. Policy and regulation 5320 is for immunization. This has been arised to provide additional guidance and to more closely align with the structure of the controlling administrative code sections. Policy and Regulation 5330.04 is for administrating um, an opioid antidote. This revision requires school, uh, schools with grades 9 through 12 to obtain an opioid antidote under a standing order. The statute requires an opioid antidote to be accessible in the school building during regular school hours and during school-sponsored functions that take place in the school or on school grounds, and this policy is mandated. Policy and Regulation 5610. As for the suspension and policy, or no, it's for a suspension and policy, and 5620 is for expulsion. <coughs> Both of these revisions require the principal of the school to be in a meeting between a student and appropriate school personnel after a student has experienced multiple suspensions or may be subject to a proposed expulsion from public school to identify any of the student's behavior or health difficulties. These policies are mandated. And the last policy. <laughs> And regulation is 8320 for personnel records. Uh, These have been revised to provide additional guidance regarding public access to personnel file information through the Open Public Records Act. And this policy is mandated. All I'm going to say is that must have been one heck of a policy meeting. And I thank the board members who are on the policy committee for for all of their hard work. And I'm glad I'm not on that. And I think we actually... (laughs) 
callers. <laughs> <laughs> the policy alerts. But thank you, Mr. Davida, for being so thorough. Um, we totally appreciate that. So, uh, under policies, can I have a motion for S17? No move, move. Second. Uh, S17 is a motion to approve the first reading of all of the following policy updates and revisions. <laughs> Any discussion? No. It was, a, it was no. a fun meeting. I bet it was. <laughs> it was. N Nicole and I were there for a very long time. I would... <laughs> No. Roll call, please. Mrs. Dichara. Yes. Mrs. Amiga. Yes. Mrs. Pandoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. Uh, under contracts, you won't see S18, but it's really there. Can I have a motion for S18? <laughs> so moved. Second. Uh, S18 is a motion to approve the below contracts based on the recommendation of the Director of Special Services for the 2021 school year. Any discussion? Oh, no. no. Roll call, please. Mrs. Dichara. Yes. Mrs. Miga. Yes. Mrs. Bondoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. Now, before I say the meeting is open to the public, I'm, I just want to make clear that if you'd like to make a comment, that's absolutely fine. You have to state your name and your address, and I just ask that you be respectful. One thing I do want to bring up, though, before um, public comment is that, and somebody put it in the chat box, and we also got a couple of emails about it, about a, uh, a supposed teacher um, who might not have done nice things who works in Cedar Grove High School. That person is not in Cedar Grove, New Jersey, uh, from what I understand, the person might be based in Georgia. So nobody like that works for us in Cedar Grove. So I just want to make that clear. And if somebody does have a, a concern about it, you know, no need to be mean or threaten legal action. Just call the board office and ask. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, so now the meeting is open to the public for comment on items on or off the agenda. Hi, uh, I have a comment. Uh, my okay, name is Great. My name is Brianna Pereira. I live at 106 Stevens Avenue in Cedar Grove. Uh, so I'm here on behalf of the Cedar Grove Verona Social Justice Group, a collection of students, alumni, and community members. And we're specifically asking uh, for education reform within the Cedar Grove School District. Uh, as alumni, we have seen and experienced discrimination within our schools, um, which has been inappropriately handled in the past. Uh, many of the incidents, in incidents presented to faculty members have been ignored or labeled as HIV cases when in fact they were clear examples of racism or other forms of prejudice. We know that Cedar Grove schools uh, to be committed to excellence and in order to realize this, we must also recognize where the school district falls short. As a group, we've received testimonials from students and alumni that involved little to no action by the district and we'd like to read some of those submissions uh, from current and past students. Uh, one student states, in my sophomore year of high school, I helped one of my best friends deal with an uncomfortable situation. My friend explained to me that her teacher had called her out for being Muslim. In the classroom, they were discussing current events. It was around 9-11, and the teacher was discussing that Muslims were the ones that planned the terrorist attack. After that sentence, he took a hard look at my friend who was wearing a hijab and asked her how she felt about what they did. He continued by asking if she was proud of being Muslim and if she was, that she should be ashamed. His infuriating questions were asked in front of the entire class and most of her classmates felt uncomfortable and helped change the topic. After this, we uh, spoke to the guidance counselor about the situation. At first she got shy and was afraid that something the teacher was going to do to call her out in the future. I explained to her that if she kept quiet, he would do the same thing to someone else. Once we sat with the counselor, I told her what the issue was, but surprisingly all she was able to focus on was why I was telling the story and not my friend. I became infuriated considering that the teacher singled out my friend for being Muslim and all she cared about was why she wasn't telling the story. My friend got upset and told her that she felt more comfortable if I spoke to her. She was shaken up about the entire situation. When we left school, her father was waiting to take us home and, tell, and we told him what happened. He showed up at the school demanding to meet the principal and that's when the school asked the teacher to step out and finally dealt with the problem. I truly believe that if the parent didn't intervene, nothing would have been done, and that is the issue with this school. Another alumni shared their story of going to Cedar Grove. She states, although I've made great friends in Cedar Grove and I cherished memories created during my time 
The school district failed to teach me how to stick up for myself. Throughout my experience, I was constantly surrounded by anti-Semitic sentiment. People, some of my own friends, joked about Jewish stereotypes in the Hebrew language. After going to the administration to help stop this, my requests were ignored, and soon I began ignoring the jokes that had a lasting impact. Fast forward four years later and experiencing other areas besides Cedar Grove, I realized the jokes and other acts of racism shouldn't have been ignored. I thought it was normal. I thought it could be tolerated. Thankfully, I went to a diverse college that taught me how to appreciate Judaism, and I learned how to teach others not to tolerate old-fashioned, outdated, and uneducated racist thought. Lastly, we have one alumni, Ava Silverman, who would like to make a statement on her behalf. Cedar Grove has been the place I called home for my entire life, and growing up in Cedar Grove... Ava, just one second. You just have to state your first and your last name and your address, and then you can say um, whatever you want. <laughs> I speak, I'm speaking on behalf of her. It's still Brianna. She just isn't able to attend now, the meeting. It, you still have to, since you're the one speaking, you kind of have to say who you are and your, and your address. Okay, well, I don't have her address, so I guess I'll just have to skip that you know, part. But what you can, you, what, the way you can do it, Ava, is you can say your name and your address, and then you can say, I am speaking on behalf, and then you can read the statement that way. My, this is still Brianna. I'm speaking on oh, behalf of oh, I'm sorry, Brianna. I thought it was Ava speaking. I'm sorry. Yeah. I apologize. Then go ahead. <laughs> what you're saying. I apologize. No, it's okay. Um, so she states that Cedar Grove has been the place she's called her home for her entire life, and growing up in the school district has certainly shaped how I've become. It's important to remember that education shapes generations, and what we learn in school impacts how we see the world. I graduated knowing there were gaps in my education and retained the belief that in order to fulfill your commitment to excellence, the Cedar Grove School District must reform the curriculum to be in inclusive of BIPOC, LGBTQ+, and disabled narratives. Students deserve to feel represented by their education and know that their peers are being educated about their experiences. As a lesbian identifying Jewish woman, I was whispered about, minimized, and made to feel like my experiences and perspective were not welcome in certain spaces. This has not even come close to what BIPOC students of Cedar Grove have had to endure. Education reform is the first step to making Cedar Grove the inclusive and accepting place it boasts as being. Thank you, and my friend Grace would like to discuss the importance of education reform. Hi, my name is, hello? Yep, go ahead. Sorry. Hi, my name is Grace. Um, I live at 117 Brunswick Road. Grace, you just um, have to give your last name also, please, okay? Oh, sorry. Grace Brawley. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be speaking on the importance of reform. So our group is here to begin a relationship with the Board of Ed, and it's hoping to work with you to prevent this from happening in the future. Many of these transgressions likely happen from a place of ignorance, not malice. In order to eliminate ignorance in the student body, we need to greatly reform our approach to teaching. The poor portrayals of minority groups in literature, history centered around a white Christian male experience, and other shortcomings in regards to equitable education marginalize students who differ from the homogenous majority of Cedar Grove. Students of color and students of different religions, abilities, genders and sexualities have been hurt by discrimination and lack of proper representation in the school district. We call for a change. Of course, the Cedar Grove School District strives to be an inclusive environment for all. And we hope to help in that in the achievement of that goal. But um, with introduction of laws regarding the requirement of education topics to discuss race, disability, LGBTQ+, and climate change, we are able to lend our knowledge to supersede the bare minimum changes leading to a more informed future. We believe that much of this change should start at an early age. A social cognitive development study conducted by Effie Baud in 2008 shows that beginning at four to five years old, expressions of racial prejudice can often peak in white children. Catherine Kinsler in her 2016 study on prejudice shows that by kindergarten, children show many of the same racial attitudes held by adults in our culture. This being said, according to Bronson and Merriman in 2009, explicit conversations with five to seven-year-olds about interracial friendships can dramatically improve their racial attitudes in as little as a single week. Because there's so much evidence supporting how important these initiatives are, we want to stay up to date and make sure we're making progress as a district. As a group, we really struggle to obtain constant contact with the Board of Education, and I'd like to know someone who is on the board that we can contact in order to organize these conversations and future discussions. 
We hope that this contact person will be able to respond to us in a timely matter since we have not yet received responses from any of the members yet. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention that in, in terms of, uh, you know, not being able to get in touch with uh, with board members, we're always here. But the best person for you to um, to have conversation with would be our, our new super, um, Mr. Tony Grasso, and his email is going to be on the district website. And I can promise you that he will respond in a timely manner. And obviously, he will be at every meeting going forward. Um, so you'll have an audience as well. So um, I ask you just to wait a couple of days until his email is official, and then you can reach out to him. But thank you. Okay. Great. Thank you so much. Um, we hope to be in touch soon. And if I can, I'd now like to hand it off to Darty Patel to speak about some of our proposed changes. Great. Thanks, Grace. Thank you. Hi everyone, um, my name is Dardy Patel. I live at 1091 Pompton Avenue. Um, and I'd just like to speak on some of our proposed changes in our petition. Um, our group is here just like you, wanting to advocate for the students of Cedar Grove School District. And we hope to lend a hand in creating a safe environment for those who are underrepresented in the CG school system. The incredible teachers of CG are working hard every day to advocate for their students and improve their teaching practices. And we hope to stand behind them um, to encourage culturally competent education within our everyday curriculum. Um, so we've sent our petition to the Board of Ed, which now has 1,597 signatures. Um, and in it, we've listed some action steps. We are more than happy to provide any clarification for um, a point that may be misunderstood. But today we have some immediate and easy action steps that we hope will be taken in the next year. Um, the first one is labeling instances of discrimination as such, instead of lumping them with other HIV cases. This can include reviewing and auditing all current policies for compliance with the current NJ law and assessing whether we are doing the bare minimum, um, as well as outlining what is considered discrimination and hate speech and what penalties can be used to counter discriminatory behavior. For example, in instances of discrimination and racism, the student should have to watch um, some sort of fact or database video like a TED talk um, discussing the topic and then you could proceed to write a paper discussing on how the behavior might be unacceptable. Um, a second action step we have is to create a professional development training for all district personnel to discuss inequities um, arising from prejudice on the basis of race, creed, color, national origin, ancestry, age, marital status, affectional or sexual orientation, gender, religion, disability, or socioeconomic status. And this is currently not only required by the NJ Administrative Code, but it's also a part of the Affirmative Action Program within the CGSD policy. Um, and lastly, we would also like to celebrate all cultural and underrepresented underrepresented group months, including Hispanic Heritage Month, which goes from September 15th to October 15th, um, African American History Month for the month of February, Women's History Mon Month for March, Asian and Pacific Heritage Month for May, and LGBTQ for June. Um, now I'd like to pass it off to my friend Reed um, to continue with some more action steps. Thank you. Thank you, Darity. So, hey, to everyone. I'm Reed, full name Hunter Reed Romanko. I live at 12 Old Quarry Road. And our fourth action step has to do with amplifying marginalized voices because it is very important to incorporate culturally competent education. It's also very important to be mindful of what voices are being raised during these discussions. We need to make sure that curriculum is inclusive of marginalized voices through all media and resources used. So we really want to make sure teachers are discouraged from showing plot-driven movies to teach about issues of diversity, even if they are based on real-life events. Instead, focus on showing documentaries based on facts and data to teach students. For example, using The Green Book, a movie about an African-American pianist in the 1960s, as the only educational tool in a history class to teach about the civil rights movement is not beneficial to students. As we all know, films are always dramatized and do not provide accurate information on the time periods they are based on. Likewise, we think it's very important that we teach the literature that is written by marginalized authors every year. Reading lists should be representative of the world's population. And I think in order to like, uh, achieve that goal, we should host a meeting with current English faculty to discuss the contents of book reserves and use what is available for the upcoming year and going forward, create a plan to order books by uh, BIPOC 
and uh, LGBTQ plus authors uh, for the future years. And uh, our last action step would be to uh, disaggregate all surveys, um, you know, the National School Climate Surveys, by gender, racial, and sexuality demographics in order to identify trends and potential disparities among underrepresented groups. So, for example, say if we notice that um, the LGBTQ plus population in Cedar Grove um, feels particularly um, marginalized, we can intervene uh, more appropriately. You know, we're very disheartened uh, that these items are not already part of our school district, especially since much of it is required by the NG, uh, NJAC and our own school district policies. As we know, this is all not an easy task to implement, and we're willing to assist in any way possible to make these changes a reality. As discussed last meeting, we know that the Board of Education is working to revamp school curriculum. Is there any update on the process of changing the curriculum, and how can we be involved in that process? We hope that this will be a transparent and collaborative process. Thank you. Thank you, Reed. We appreciate that. I wasn't sure if there was somebody else who was about to speak. Um, so we are actually, the plan is to take a look at the curriculum. I mean, we've talked about this the last few meetings. Obviously, we believe in change. And uh, and there's definitely some things that we can do better. Um, one of the things is obviously we're waiting for our, our new super to, to start. And uh, as I've emphasized, he hasn't yet. Um, but also the priority right now is to get back to school, to figure out how to get back to school um, and to get a plan out there. Um, and, you know, as... In curriculum writing takes time. It's a it's a process, and it's one thing if you just want to you know slap some some buzzwords you know in the curriculum, but that's not that's not going to drive meaningful change. I mean, if if you, what you're looking for is is true change and and taking a look at you know what we teach and and things like that, that's a process that the super does you know with the curriculum writers. They sit and they figure out what are they trying to change, what is, what needs to be addressed, and that takes time. And we're committed to doing that. It just I, everybody's got to just be a little bit patient on how quickly we can move. Oh, of course. I totally understand. It is a very laborious and time-intensive process. And again, we want to help with that. So the big thing we're trying to figure out right now is how we can be involved to make it a bit easier for all y'all. Because it is definitely an overwhelming and at times uh, very, very daunting task. Okay, well, and, and we're definitely going to pick this back up again, you know, soon after August 3rd, you know, and then we can have a discussion with Tony as he's the super as, as far as how he would like to proceed with this. So we appreciate that, though. Uh, yeah, of course. Thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And likewise, you know, keep the baton passing. Going. I'd like to uh, pass the baton to Carolyn Maxwell. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Carolyn Maxwell, and I live at 67 Elmwood Road. Hi, Carolyn. Hi. We know that the Board of Ed is managing a lot at the moment with pressures on changing curriculum to reflect LGBTQ plus and disability inclusivity by the deadline of the school year, as well as determining what the 2020 school year will look like. That being said, we are hoping that the ideas which we have presented will minimize, minimize and hopefully eliminate discrimination and hostility in Cedar Grove school environment. We also hope that we can be included in future curriculum and policy conversations. Our group wants to be an ally and a resource for the Board of Education. We welcome conversations and collaborations with all of you um, to open up a dialogue with you as well as Mr. Grosso. Um, we can be reached at our email, cgsdeducationreform at gmail.com. We look forward to speaking with you. As for our last question, we are hoping that you can elaborate on the diversity committee and how residents can apply to be a part of the committee. Our neighboring towns have begun this process and we hope that Cedar Grove can follow suit by starting off the new school term right. Thank you for all your hope, hard work and we hope to hear from you soon. Thank you, Carolyn. We appreciate it. Um, as far as the committee that we talked about, uh, we are going to talk more about that once we have an opportunity to sit down with our new super. Um, you know, having the other super leave and being in between supers has slowed down things a little bit. Um, but that is one of the first things that we're going to talk to him about is exactly how we want to form this committee and what the goal of the committee is. So just stay tuned for a little bit on, uh, until we have a, a better answer on that one. Okay, that sounds great. Um... We're excited to be working with you going forward. Great. Thank you very much. 
Would anybody else like to make a comment? Yes, I would. Great. Hi, my name is Affy Lamptey. I live at 40 Pine Drive, Cedar Grove, New Jersey. Hi, Affy. Thanks for joining us. Hi, how are you? Um, Great. So I just kind of want to um, be of support for the alumni that just spoke. As a parent in town, and I also have two African-American boys that will be attending school in district. I have one already, and the other one will be starting kindergarten. Um, I do see the importance of this. I would like to extend myself to uh, be a pro in the process or work with whoever's in the process of um, reforming the current curriculum. Um, my only thing is, and my request is, if it's not me, I think that if we are going to be focusing on more diversity and inclusion within Cedar Grove, we need the committee to represent that. Having a committee that only has people of um, Caucasian descent um, will not be as effective as if we have a committee that is more diverse. So that will be just what I would like to say for today. Thank you very much. And we'll take that under advisement and we'll definitely be sure to talk to the uh, the superintendent as far as the committee and how it's, how it's gonna be structured. So thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, I close that portion of the meeting. Uh, announcement of future meetings. So right now it says August 18th, um, but we will be having a meeting uh, much earlier in August because obviously we need to uh, to talk about the, uh, the back to school plan. So just stay tuned. And within the next couple of days, we'll be posting on the board website, the date of that meeting. Um, and then, so like I said, August 18th um, and then September 15th, um, who knows what the next couple of weeks bring, if we will be able to have our meeting in person. I'm actually hoping that we're going to be able to do that socially distanced. Um, we just didn't have enough time for this evening's meeting to try to put that together. Um, Bye. Can I have a motion to adjourn? There's a question in the chat. Um, we don't really answer questions in the chat. I mean, and it was a public session so, or a public part of the meeting. That was the time to ask the question. I, uh, I apologize. I didn't realize that I had to um, speak. So it, it is uh, Jenny Villanueva, North End School teacher. I just wanted to clarify something. Okay, so hold on one second, Jenny. If you want to speak, just state your first and your last name and uh, and your address, and I will reopen that portion of the meeting for you. Okay. Do I'm a teacher in the district. I don't live in town. Does that still matter? Have, yeah, you still have to state your address, okay. though. Okay, Jenny Villanueva, 18 Postbrook Road, uh, West Milford, New Jersey. Thank you. Go ahead. I just was curious about the policy. I was listening to that um, kind of closely, and it ta you, it, you talked about the Federal Family First uh, Corona uh, response as part of the policy. And then you mentioned something about an emergency uh, policy that was also put into place, but I didn't catch it. And I went back to the agenda, and I don't see it there. So I was just wondering if you could explain what that is or what it's called so I can uh, look into it more. Yep. Yeah, sure. It, it's the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act. Um, if you want, to, I could read again what, what, what it has in here. Um, it says that this requires the employer to provide paid sick time to the extent the employee is unable to work or telework due to the employee being subject to a government-ordered quarantine, advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine, experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, and is seeking a medical diagnosis, uh, caring for an individual who has been ordered to quarantine or has been advised to quarantine or caring for their son or daughter at the school or a child care provider has been closed and it provides for up to 80 hours of paid time off. So, okay. I mean, this is just the, the summary over here. I mean, the, the, the law, uh, I'm sure, would, would have gone into a lot more uh, uh, detail about it. Okay. I will. Um, I just was curious as to what it, what it really was called so I can... Uh, educate myself as well so thank you then the, the policy i think the policy should be um online even though we just had our first reading on it um and it's if you look up uh, uh 1649 
Um, it, it, and it should give like the, the wording in, in, in the policy there for, for what it states. Okay, so it's part of 1649. Yes. Okay, that's what I think I missed. Okay, thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Okay, now I'm going to close that portion of the meeting again. I've already talked about future meetings. Can I have a motion to adjourn? So move. So move. Nope. Second. Roll call, please. This is Dechara. Yes. This is Miga. Yes. Mr. Spondoria. Aye. Mr. Schoner. Aye. Mrs. Dye. Yes. This meeting is over. Everybody have a good night and stay safe. Good night, everybody.